So I will uh, go ahead to record this meeting. Just a minute. All right. Um, so uh, just a brief, uh, my name is Samuel Ibanda and uh, I'm a tutor at uh, Achievers Professional Trainers. Achievers Professional Trainers uh, is one of uh, the leading institutions that are in the area of uh, CPA and other accounting professional courses. So uh, we have organized these trainings basically to help our students, especially during this time of lockdown, to see how we can continue to learn. I know some of you might have uh, might be joining uh, online classes for the very first time, but given the situation that is at hand, this is how we have to proceed. We have to make sure that we we can cope up with the change uh, of us not being able to meet, but being able to still learn and progressing with our CPA journey. So today is MDC. Uh, we have this paper also. Uh, when you look at our timetable, if, if you've seen our timetable, this paper also is, um, let me just confirm. This paper is also on, uh, I think, Saturday. Yeah, it's on Saturday from uh, 2 to 5. And uh, today uh, is basically uh, uh, Thursday where we had planned to basically do a revision class. Yeah, so we shall try to, to see how we can work together. I know some of you must have done MDC before, uh, but I believe still there will be something for you to take away from uh, this session. At the end of the day, learning never stops and uh, you have to keep yourself uh, grounded to uh, tapping into any learning opportunities that might come there. So, Thank you so much uh, for being part of this. Uh, I'll dig deep in, uh, into the paper. Now, for, for those that are joining for the very first time, as you indicated, I didn't see anyone say they are joining this for the very second time. Uh, but for those that are joining this for the first time, maybe you're level one and you want to do now a paper in level two, maybe you've been doing advanced, maybe taxation and other papers, and you now want to do paper 11. Uh, I want to say that uh, the MDC paper builds up from uh, quantitative techniques, which is paper two, and cost and management accounting. Now, most of you uh, are exempted the cost and management accounting, maybe because you have uh, previously, you have accounting backgrounds. So cost and management accounting is exempted to you. So it is presumed that you, 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 you carry over this knowledge from your other maybe level of education to uh to, to this paper so those that do the cost and management accounting will actually find this paper very friendly because the concepts uh, are not very different only that uh, mpc is a, is a little uh, trying to advance from the principles of cost and management accounting we are trying to see how can we use uh, those principles to be able to make decisions use those techniques to be able to make decisions the same thing with quantitative techniques. Not everything that is in quantitative techniques, you redefine it in MDC. We just pick a few techniques, uh, a few techniques uh, around, uh, for example, linear programming. Uh, we pick a few techniques around uh, maybe regression analysis. Yeah, just a few, few, few things that we really pick from quantitative techniques. But for cost and management accounting, there's a lot that we pick from it even as we proceed to study our paper 11. Now, this paper, for you who is preparing for this uh, exam, you have to know that uh, the examiner is looking towards to, to see what is the critical role of management accountants in the organizations and what kind of, uh, what is it, that kind of advice they provide when it comes to the decision making. Now, uh, I just want to uh, brief you basically. Now, this paper, 
as you can see, it is management decision and control. So we know very well that every day management makes decisions, makes decisions around what to uh, maybe to produce, which customer to serve, uh, which industry to, to join, uh, what way to renumulate staff, uh, things to do with bonuses, uh, salaries, what ways to cut costs, different things. So on a day-to-day -day basis, management makes decisions on very many things. Now, this paper prepares us as people who are under the category of management accountants to be able to support management to make the right decisions. So because we are accountants, we provide information. By information, it means uh, we've read it. It's not data. It's information. It's information. It's, 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 it's processed kind of uh, data that can be able to support management make decisions. A case in point, management may have just received an order from let's say maybe a company, uh, maybe uh, right now we in the lockdown and maybe uh, a company like, let's say maybe either Renzoli gets a special order from maybe Ministry of Health to uh, maybe to provide water for the health workers in the hospitals during this time. And Minister of Health, instead of giving uh, uh, Renzoli water, uh, maybe a, buying the bottle at maybe the standard price of 1,000, Minister of Health may be proposing to buy water at 700, maybe based on the situation that is around. So management has to make a decision on whether to take on such, such an order or not uh, to take on such an order. So uh, that, uh, those are some of the things that management has to think through. Right now, we are going through a hard situation where costs, um, costs are high, management is spending on rent, spending on several kinds of things, but the kind of revenue that is coming through is really very low. So at the end of the day, oh, okay, Florence, thank you for your comment here noted so at the end of the day you want to uh, uh see how can management use this time the decisions that they are making right now what kind of information can you provide to them to be able to make decisions of course we know very well that um, when we are making decisions it's not all about the figures it's not about you calculating and maybe uh getting a profit at the end of the day in your calculation remember these are projections we also have qualitative factors that might affect. So when management is making decisions, it is not, not only basing on the quantitative uh, quantitative factors that uh, are provided by us management accountants, but also on the qualitative factors of what exactly is happening. So it is very important. So management decision and control is, uh, please, I'll, I'll request you to uh, immediately join. You try to mute so that you don't interrupt the class. So there is also the aspect of control. Now, why control uh, uh, in this paper and why uh, comes out even in the name of the paper is because any organization has what we call a plan. It could be a strategic plan. It could be an annual plan. It could be, uh, it could be an operation plan, whatever plan it is. And at the end of the day, that plan management is interested to make sure that that plan results into actions. So if management has planned to maybe sell, uh, maybe uh, revenue to the tune of over maybe 300 million, you have to make sure that uh, you put control mechanisms along the way. And within the control mechanisms, we shall uh, try to look at aspects of budgeting, uh, aspect of variance analysis, uh, trying to, uh, uh, how do we management set standards? Because these standards are the standards that we use to measure ourselves at the end of the day to see, are we, uh, are we making progress or are we actually not making progress? So we shall look at those different techniques that uh, are really very important, especially in the area of uh, control as well as the area of decision making 
if you unmute and you're not saying anything, I'll get you out of the class because that interrupts the class. So make sure that you don't tap your mute unmute button. People are really very stubborn. Okay, I proceed. So basically, um, once you're done with this paper, now why why we studied the paper? This paper other than other papers that prepares uh, us to on aspects of financial accounting, financial reporting, this paper is preparing us on the aspects of management accounting. Management accountants, uh, their role is to transform the financial accounting results, at the cost accounting results into a form that is best understood by management. You remember management, uh, mostly these are nanny, uh, finance people. So this paper prepares you to be able to transform the financial results. Whatever is happening, the side of uh, uh, financial reporting, how does that transform into this uh, advice that management will base on to make the decisions? And that is why you see uh, some organizations have what we call management accountants. And these management accountants are usually involved in the work of uh, budgeting, in the work of, uh, of preparing monthly reports to management, just a kind of interpretation of what is happening. If a company has made maybe uh, 20 million this month and has made maybe 30 million in the next month, what does that mean? Because that is where management is interested to know. Because you know, as we, we, we prepare all these financial reporting and financial accounting results, we have, uh, we have several assumptions that we make. We have different guidelines that really follow. But management at the end of the day wants to, what kind of decisions can we make from the financial results? So that is what management accountants do. And that's what this paper basically will really prepare you on, on that. I'm trying to labor to go through all this because I know we have people who have just joined this paper and you really want to know what is really ahead of you. And of course, uh, I'm trying to give you this kind of guidance of what you really should know. If you've done this paper before, um, these, some of these things might be very familiar to you, but it's a good conversation for us to uh, understand more why this paper and why are we studying it and why is it helpful and what should I really know? Because I usually get students who, uh, who are on the CPA and for them there is to pass the paper and just get away. At the end of the day, we forget about the fact that the knowledge that we are studying from this paper should be able to apply to our organizations. Once you're done with this paper, sh this should be able to reflect even in the, in the work that you do, because you're presumed to be able to, uh, uh, to add value to the organization in everything that you do. So as a learner who is uh, on this paper, uh, some of the things that you should have in mind is, uh, is that uh, you should uh, be able to understand that if I am a management accountant, even if you're not a management accountant, because the role of management accountants, it's very common that it's taken up by even accountants because organizations may not afford to have a distinctive person who is doing management accounting. So if you're that finance officer, if you're that uh, accountant in that organization, what kind of roles can you play that feed into the management accounting role at the end of the day? So we shall try to understand why management accountants are very key. And you, these are very simple things uh, in regards to uh, 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 the way organizations run. I've already talked, uh, ma management accountants are, are very much seen on the areas of planning. Now by planning, this is where we, we do the strategic plans, we do the operation plans and get down onto the budgets. Management accountants really support this whole process of planning. Even when it will come to organizations, those that have worked in organizations where there is a distinctive management accountant, it is the management accountants that coordinate the budgeting process. When a uh, sales department does the budget, uh, when purchase department does the budget, when HR does the budget, it is the management accountant who will combine all these budgets to make sure that they correlate with each other. If sales department is saying they are increasing uh, maybe they are sales representatives or uh, the sales team. This should be able to also reflect on the HR budget because at the end of the day, it's the HR that's going to meet this kind of salary. So the management accountant helps on this area 
of making sure that they support the aspect of planning. So the planning uh, role is uh, uh, very key. The aspect of uh, control, I read it, I talked to you about the aspect of control. Control is making sure that your plan results into the action. So at the end of the day, after we've done the planning as a role, management also uh, is interested to make sure that you don't divert from the plan and not diverting for the plan. Who helps us uh, do most of this kind of work is the management accountant, you the management accountant. And how do you do that? Because if management has set um, uh, a goal of making, let's say, revenue over, let's say, maybe 2 billion shillings for this year, if at all you get to, uh, to the month of uh, uh, maybe month of March, and uh, ideally, of course, if it's two, if it's two billion, uh, you would want to say that maybe every month they would have about maybe uh, at, at least maybe 200 million, maybe if not 200 million, maybe 150 million at, at least. So if the organization is only making, let's say, maybe, maybe 20 million for the first three months of the year, now, as a management accountant, because you, you're, on, you're on top of the game to make sure that you're looking at the monthly performance of the organization, you're able to help management to, to correct the, any defects that might be happening during this time before we actually get to maybe the mid, mid of the year. Because if you're making 20 million every, every, every month and your projection was 2 billion shillings, it's, it's something that uh, if by the third month you're still on 20 million per month, it should be an eye opener. So that is where how the aspect of control comes in. It's not only that. If management has set a standard of its, uh, maybe it's producing water and it has certain kind of uh, standards in terms of what raw material shall be used to produce that water, what kind of um, uh, maybe, uh, maybe the elect labor in terms of cost would be attributed to that water, several kind of things and maybe overheads as well. If at all you make an analysis and you think that on average, on a single bottle of water, management is actually spending a double of what it planned, then you're able to highlight this. Now, all this that you're doing is the aspect of control because you're helping management correct any, any kind of defects that it may be having at that point in time before you actually get to the less at the end of the year. So management accountants play a key role on the aspect of control. As well as uh, management accountants are also very key on the aspect of, um, of organization. Uh, by organization here, we are looking at uh, the, uh, the aspect of um, uh, the organization structure. Now, in having an optimal structure, because every organization requires an optimal structure to be able to deliver the day-to-day -day work of, of, of the organization. Now, what happens here is that uh, once uh, the organization is set up, the management accountant is able to, uh, to give an insight in terms of what, is, what kind of structure can be able to be accommodated by the organization. Because at the end of the day, every staff that is on the organization structure is cost, is, has a cost attached to them. So at the end of the day, uh, the management accountant support management in giving such a kind of analysis. If maybe it's a production plant and uh, there's a kind of uh, maybe revenue that's being gotten from a given production plant. In terms of the structure that is supporting that uh, production plant, is it an effective structure? Is it a structure that is cost effective? And that is why you see uh, you're able to even advise management maybe to reduce on the staff, to have a lean structure, to do restructuring and so on. So that would also be one of uh, the other roles. So there are several of them, including motivation, uh, why uh, management accountants are very key in the aspect of motivation is they provide information to, uh, to, to, to management on the way the organization is performing. For example, if maybe an organization is, uh, 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 maybe have, it has a sales team, on a day-to-day -day basis, if there is information in regards to how the sales team is performing, then it motivates even the team to even work much better. Because at the end of the day, I think you've been in uh, those that are working, you've been uh, maybe at a point in time where uh, uh, you're looking at the results of how the organization has been performing, maybe for the, for the rest of the year. And it's, 
it gives you uh, a self-fulfillment as an individual to see the kind of uh, value that you're actually creating. And it is from that, those results, those good results that sometimes management actually even goes ahead to even provide bonuses to its staff. So even in MDC, uh, one of the topics that we shall be looking at uh, is the performance measurement and, and also uh, aspects of reward. How, what kind of forms of reward are available for management to its employees? Because we know at the end of the day, the employees play a key role in making sure that the organization achieves its own results. So that is very critical. And then at the end of the day, you also have to make sure that you, you're able to provide relevant advice in different decision making situations. Now, one of the things that you have to know as a management accountant is that you have different levels in the organization. You have the operation level, you have the tactical level, you have the strategic level. And at a different point in time, of course, there are also different circumstances uh, in terms of uh, uh, decision making. So you have to know what kind of uh, advice, what kind of uh, uh, maybe recommendations can I be able to give in every kind of situation? And here we shall get down on two uh, different uh, areas. For example, uh, we shall look at areas of CVP, cost volume profit analysis, and we shall try to understand how we use uh, the cost volume profit analysis to make some decisions, maybe it's decisions around pricing, maybe decisions around uh, what quantities produce, decisions around break even analysis to make sure that we understand when, uh, when will the organization make, make money in terms of uh, when will the organization exceed its total cost to start actually making money. So we will understand that we'll get into down into aspects of short-term decision-making. Short-term decision-making here, we are looking at either we are shutting down uh, a given plant or we, we are continuing either shut or continue. Aspects of uh, either buy or make. For example, if, uh, if you're into uh, maybe just like the bottling uh, uh, kind of company, maybe like Coca-Cola, it would reach a point in time where it is making a decision on should we continue to really to have uh, the company, that uh, maybe the, the plant that makes the bottles, or we can actually buy these bottles from a specialized company that is only dealing in the production of bottles. And maybe for us, we concentrate on the production of soda. So we will understand how would we make decisions in terms of uh, maybe short-term decisions or long-term decisions. Uh, like short-term decisions, I've given you different, uh, uh, some of the examples of uh, buy or make or shut down. Uh, we also have special order decisions, like I've given you an example of Ministry of Health ordering right now, maybe from Coca-Cola at a lower price than the actual price that is there. Uh, we will look at several of them and see decisions also around reward, how, when do we uh, reward uh, maybe employees, aspects of bonuses to management, aspects of uh, divisionalization, how do we evaluate different divisions? For example, just like the way you see banks are structured with different divisions, how, are we how do we make sure that uh, br branch uh, Alua, branch uh, maybe branch Kampala, are evaluated on a monthly basis using the different techniques. So very important for us to understand that. So at the end of the day, you should also be able to develop organizational budgets. Now, budgeting is very, very key. And like I said, as management accountants, one of our key role is the aspect of planning. And it is from the plans that we're able to get the organization budgets. Organization budgets is basically a financial representation of what management has planned. So management, if management plans to make maybe revenue of over 200 million, maybe it plans to uh, maybe hire staff of a given category, it plans to uh, maybe production cost of, uh, of, of, of a given amount, it's you who now compels all that into an organization budget. So we shall understand how you can prepare uh, budgets. Of course, we have different techniques, uh, techniques uh, uh, like maybe zero best budgeting, where we all start from uh, from 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 zero. Basically, there is no uh, uh, we don't have to look at maybe the previous year's budget. Uh, we shall look at aspects of incremental budgeting. As some of you might have heard about incremental budgeting, this is very common in uh, like in the public sector. 
uh, in uh, uh, government uses a lot of uh, incremental budgeting. And by incremental budgeting here, uh, incremental budgeting, what usually happens with incremental budgeting is uh, you use either the performance of the previous year or maybe the budget of the previous year, depending. And then you build on to that in terms of uh, what you now spend in the next year. For example, if today, uh, this, is, uh, this is June and we are finishing this financial year, if management is planning, for example, for the next financial year, maybe their financial starts first, uh, maybe first July, uh, maybe to again, 30th June, 2022. So management uses the performance of this financial year to build on, to develop a budget of the next year. Of course, one of the advantages like of, um, of, 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 of budgeting techniques like incremental budgeting is the aspect that it's very easy and it's, 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 it's less uh, time consuming. Because at the end of the day, you have the performance of last year, you just get it. And let's say maybe you on different items, you just maybe add 10%. For example, if uh, last year maybe you maybe you spent uh, let's say maybe twenty million on your on maybe repairs repair costs, this year you might add maybe a ten percent onto onto the repair costs, and then you have maybe something for this year. And then and then one of the other things that uh, you also need to know when it comes to incremental budgeting is the aspect of uh, making sure that uh, you're looking at the previous figures. But one of the disadvantages that I want to uh, uh, highlight here is that incremental budgeting comes with a lot of inefficiencies from the previous period. It may also come with, uh, why, why do I say inefficiencies? It's because if last year you spent maybe 20 million, maybe because you, you used a wrong maybe technician on, on, on your motor vehicle repairs, this year does not mean that you'll actually, again, you incur the same cost because last year you incurred it because you made maybe wrong decisions on to either your production or to what kind of services that you used. So it's very important for you to uh, have that in mind. So that is why some organizations opt for the zero-based budgeting where they start from all the start and make sure that they develop a budget that is well thought out, a budget that reflects what exactly is happening in the market a budget that uh, uh, best uh, defines on where the organization is going. Because the case in point, if we're in this time like this, where we, are, uh, we have unstable, uh, we, uh, the unstable market, we cannot tell what tomorrow will happen. It is not really advisable for you to use the previous year's budget because previous year is totally had different dynamics compared to this year. We cannot tell when the next, what the next half of the year will really bring. So that is why it's important for you to understand the different appropriate techniques that can be used in the area of budgeting. And then we shall also try to uh, look at some quantitative models and accounting control techniques uh, to managerial decisions. Uh, I already talked of, uh, we picked some models like linear programming uh, from uh, paper two. We also pick uh, different other techniques like from cost and management accounting, uh, different techniques here like the CVP uh, uh, models. We also do the EO2 models. Uh, the EO2 is uh, economic order quantity for inventory. Uh, we get down, we also look at aspects of TQM, uh, total quality management. We had look at lead, lead, time, uh, lead uh, time management. Uh, we look at different techniques in here and see how do we use those kind of techniques to be able to make decisions uh, for the organization, to be able to support management, make different decisions. The accounting control techniques, I already talked about the aspect of control. So we also have those. And here, that's where we even get into things like standard variance analysis, uh, ETC, to see how can we make sure that uh, uh, whatever we plan, whatever budgets we have, these get into our actions. So where we are doing budget variance analysis, trying to look at what is the budget, what is the actual and getting uh, variance either, uh, maybe the variance is either adverse, you get it. So we will go through all this. 
as a learner, you should also make sure that you understand how to measure and evaluate the performance of business segments. I already say that uh, performance uh, measurement and evaluation is one of uh, our key topics here. And the uh, reason why this is very key is that most organizations these days have chosen to work in terms of business segments, in terms of branches, in terms of uh, subsidiaries. Uh, you know very well that, for example, if it's Airtel, Airtel uh, may have regional branches, uh, may not only be Airtel, but uh, uh, you could look at banks. I think the aspect of business segments is very key when it comes to banks. So we shall see how do we evaluate performance of business segments? And here we are looking at how do we evaluate the performance of every division? We call them divisions in this paper. Also, we get down to understand, you know, when you are evaluating divisions, you're looking at, uh, uh, at the divisional profit. Now, we also have key uh, uh, areas here that we also have to look at when we are doing the evaluation. We also evaluate in terms of uh, how the management, in term, who, the manager of that division, how they are operating, because it is based on that evaluation that we're able to reward uh, the managers of different organizations. So we shall look at aspects of um, uh, controllable profits. Uh, by controllable profits, those are usually profits of a division that a manager can, uh, can, can, has control over. Uh, we shall look at uh, aspects of traceable profits. By traceable profits, I mean profits that can be traced to a given division. Of course, the reason why we bring in the aspect of controllable and uh, traceable is when it comes to controllable there are some pro there are some costs and some kind of revenue that is not within the control of let's say a branch manager i'll give you an example if uh maybe uh, i'm a branch manager of uh, maybe kcb bank uh maybe kampala you may find uh that there are kind of costs for example the ceo's salary who is sitting at head office may it be allocated across all branches. Maybe we have 10 branches and let's say every branch is taking on 10%. So if that is the case, that every branch is taking on 10%, you find that me as a manager of KCB Bank Kampala branch, I ha really have no control over that 10%. At the end of the day, if I'm doing cost cutting, that 10% is standard and I really don't have any kind of control over how to uh, maybe either reduce or increase. So that will not be part of my, uh, uh, my, my, my calculations when I'm calculating my controllable profits. So we shall look at all those aspects and see how, what, how do we uh, incorporate as such ideologies as well as aspects of, let's say, uh, the, like I said, traceable profits. By traceable profits, like I indicated here, we are trying to look at those profits that can only be traceable to a given division. Because at the end of the day, divisions will also have uh, certain kind of costs that may be imposed by, uh, by, 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 by management. Because at the end of the day, uh, some of the costs that are being spent at the head office, head office does not generate revenue. So these costs have to be met by the different divisions. So when they are looking at the performance of the division, they will also include a charge of, let's say, the CEO salary, maybe the charge of the human resource department or from the head office. So we'll get down to understand how to evaluate business segments and then also apply uh, advanced management techniques we have uh, uh, key management techniques and, and also uh, techniques that are coming up every day you know with the dynamics of the world we have uh, things like balance scorecard we have different other techniques that are coming the t2ms are also uh, some of uh, key management techniques. We shall look at advanced management techniques that are coming up to see how we can we incorporate them in, in the way we uh, support management when it comes to the decision uh, making, as well as uh, making sure that uh, we, uh, we apply the, uh, the as, as aspect of ethics, the decision making. You know, management accountants, we are very critical people in uh, the organization. Whatever you say, management builds confidence on that to be able to make decisions. So if we don't have ethics, if we are not ethical in the kind of information that we are providing to management, by ethics, I mean 
where we are objective. You're not advising management to uh, maybe borrow from a given bank over the other because you've already been given a check to attract management to, towards, maybe management wants to acquire a, a, a new asset and uh, maybe you've already collided with the supplier to be able to inflate the price and you're advising management that it's actually, it's okay for you to go ahead to buy. So it is very good for us to understand what are our learning outcomes. I know most of you don't look at some of these things even when you start the paper. They seem not to be relevant to you, but it's good for you to have an insight of what is really ahead of you and what should I really, even before I go to the paper, what should really, uh, no, this is basically a summary because when you get, when we get down to the detailed syllabus, you get to realize that uh, this paper is, um, is has, uh, it gets down into depth, most of those concepts, you get it. So it is, uh, it is very, very important for you. So when we get down onto uh, uh, the level of assessment, uh, by level of assessment, we are looking at the exam. Uh, we're trying to see uh, what exactly does the examiner wants to, uh, to, uh, to examine us. Now, this paper, because it's management decision and control, management expects that as you as a person, you can be able to uh, interpret, analyze, evaluate, and apply the knowledge, of course, the skills that you, you've really uh, gotten from here, but relating to real life situations. Because uh, most of these papers you'll see, it's, uh, they'll bring you different case studies. They'll bring you relatable issues that are actually happening at the workplace. And for, you're able to analyze a given uh, situation Maybe I'll just try to share one of the papers here to help us understand, especially how this exam looks like. So this is a, a, a one of the MDC papers. Uh, this is a 2019. Now, why am I might uh, trying to go through this paper because we want to understand what is ahead of us if we are studying. At the end of the day, how shall we be examined? Why it is important is because it gives you a picture of your end, of, of, where, of where you're going. Imagine you're running and uh, you don't know where you're going. At the end of the day, you looking at uh, a past paper question like this, it helps you to build your confidence. So this paper, like any other paper, is three hours, 15 minutes, and uh, it has a compulsory question, which carries 40 marks. And uh, you know, when it's a compulsory question, means that uh, any topic can actually be chosen. So you have no option but to make sure that you understand all the topics in this paper because these 40 marks are very key to you. Uh, if you, you can't really raise a half of them, then you risk because at the end of the day, uh, yes, you can actually uh, get the four questions in section, uh, maybe three questions in section B but you're not, you're not guaranteed that you'll actually pass all of them. So it's very important for you to know that section A has 40 marks and I should be able to get at least, at least minimum. Yours, you sh yours should be strive at least to get a 30, maybe a 20, a 25 at the end of the day, because that helps you to increase your chances of making sure that you're getting a good mark in this paper. So section B, has uh, the four questions and you only choose three and each question carries 20 marks. So basically that is how the paper looks like. As you can see, this is how question one is. It's usually a bit uh, detailed because of course at the end of the day, they have to make sure that they ask uh, the relevant questions onto this paper that uh, can be able to give you all those kind of marks. So the, I think you can see, as you can see, this question was asking us to advise uh, the finance director on the less profitable customer in the quarter. Now there's uh, what we call uh, customer profitability analysis. Uh, by customer profitability analysis, here you're trying to, uh, this is very common, I think, uh, uh, very common in banks. And that is why you see banks may will go ahead to even create executive branches because at the end of the day, uh, businesses have continuously realized that actually uh, different customers 
bring in different revenues and we also incur different costs on different customers. So why it is important for organizations to evaluate and see uh, what ev every customer is bringing in is at the end of the day, uh, uh, businesses want to concentrate on serving those profitable customers and uh, also try as much as possible to transform these other customers into profitable customers. This is also very common in the telecom world. I think some of you, uh, usually sometimes you, you, you're calling uh, customer care services and uh, they take time to pick you up and another person calls. It's because they have tried to include these aspects of customer uh, profitability ranking and to make sure that they want to give more time to the person who who loads uh, maybe uh, 200,000 for the airtime than somebody who even uh, borrows a 500 and takes a month to actually pay back. So customer profitability analysis is very key. And uh, such a question, you see they, they were giving it 28 marks. So if you're a student who has never prepared for this topic, who does not understand it, these 20 marks just go out of your heart. And all you remain with is maybe the, the, these marks, which marks may also not be assured because at the end of the day, you also have to, uh, 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 to make sure that you, you've prepared for them. So that is why you see uh, for this paper, you need to give it your all because if anything happens and uh, they bring a topic where you really don't have confidence in, then you have a problem, you get it. Because uh, now these others, uh, this could be very simple things like evaluating the impact of a just-in-time system. Uh, by just-in-time, I think uh, uh, when somebody says just-in-time means that organizations order as and when uh, the customer is interested. And even the producing, producing production is only done when the customer has actually made an order. The just-in-time system comes in to reduce on the inventory cost of uh, the holding cost of inventory to make sure that we don't have a lot of inventory. You know, there are different costs that come with holding inventory. Costs like uh, sold sense inventory, uh, losing value, costs like um, uh, aspects of uh, maybe insurance. Maybe you want to insure your inventory. Spoilage may come through different, different costs. And of course, at the end of the day, also the normal costs like maybe warehouse rent because you're holding this inventory and uh, it has really cost you some amount of money. So very important for us to understand the just-in-time system. It's a, it's a Japan system, uh, way of doing things. So that is very key. Here they're asking you this, the limitations of standard costing and variance analysis. Uh, this is in the aspect of control. This is a, a full topic that we shall be look, looking at. We are also looking at uh, the asking you limitations of the just in time system. And by here, just, just in time, like I've said, you only order for stock as and when you need it and when a customer. Here, of course, just in time, one of the limitations with it is the aspect of uh, the reliability of suppliers. For example, if right now uh, maybe you were uh, you're dealing in, in, in imported products and uh, you only order when the customer needs it. A point in time when you cannot access maybe uh, your supplier because of the lockdown, then you cannot serve your customer. And that is why people who have now, who are, who are not using the just-in-time system, who have stock in their warehouse are able to benefit. Of course, every technique has its advantages and disadvantages, and we shall get down into deep to understand that. But the key thing is to understand the concept, understand what exactly uh, does this system do. At the end of the day, they can bring any question around that, either to explain it, either to give limitations and like that. Like you've seen, this paper has an element of theory as well as the element of calculations. Now, uh, some students concentrate more on the area of uh, calculations and forget about the aspect of uh, theory. Now, the theory itself is very key because when you, when you do extensive reading and understand these concepts, you can be able to earn like some of these marks. But at the end of the day also, one of the other things that also uh, this helps you is the aspect of uh, uh, making sure, you know, the examiner will set even a calculation question. They'll set it in a way that 
it brings in uh, ideas from the theoretical concept. So if you don't know the theoretical background of a given topic, then uh, you misinterpret some of the information that is provided at the end of the day. So it is imperative for you to make sure that you extensively understand some of these concepts. So that is question one and question uh, section B, as you can see, uh, question, this question two, this is PGL, but what some of the questions here. So they, here they are bringing in the aspect of uh, graphical method of linear programming. And this is why I say that uh, your knowledge from paper two uh, is very important here. Uh, of course, we build on onto this, the linear programming that you studied, but it's this very, basically similar principles here. So if you're good at uh, linear programming, this should be able to, uh, to be much easier. Yeah, this one question, even here, opportunity cost of obtaining additional driver uh, to ex and explain its maximum contribution. This, is, this was all uh, about linear programming, four areas of application of linear programming. Yeah, you can see these are eight marks, which you can easily get without having, uh, you know, you know, with your, the theoretical questions, these ones, either you know, either you don't know. It's not like for the calculations where you make, instead of writing a two, you, you write a three, and at the end of the day, uh, you end up messing up. So very important for you to understand this. Now, this paper, I know uh, you might have had it's a hard paper, but it's a paper that you can pass at first attempt. I know many, uh, uh, many students who uh, I have had who have uh, gone through this paper and have passed it at first attempt. Those that are not serious, definitely go ahead to face the paper again for the second time, because it's just like any other CPA paper. I, want, I don't want to tell you that uh, with this paper, you don't need to put in a lot of effort. You can just pass it. You need to prepare. You need to understand. Now, like you can see, uh, here they are trying to say using the information provided above advice care case management on whether the, com the computer laboratory will be completed in term three as planned. Like like the way I I already I already gave you insights on this. Somebody is asking you why incremental budgeting approach is commonly used by organizations. I already told you about incremental budgeting and I said this is very common, especially in the public sector, where you uh, uh you use the previous financial performance either previous financial performance or the budget of this year to build on, to make sure that you, you, you make now your new budget. So why it is, it's, it's, it's not, they're saying why it is not commonly used by organization. Like I told you, one is because of um, the changing trends. You cannot use uh, maybe the budget of last year, use it for this year, because this year is now totally different from last year. The cost that you incurred, if you incurred fuel of a given amount of money, this year might be totally different. And of course, at the end of the day, I also talked of the aspect of uh, carrying over previous inefficiencies. Now, this is uh, those that have uh, heard about maybe the way government works. You know, government, if, uh, if, if a given, let's say, local district, local government wants to get money, more money in the next financial year, they will strive to make sure that they utilize all the money that they received in this year. Because at the end of the day, uh, government uses incremental budgeting. If you didn't spend, let's say, maybe 20 million in last year, government will not give you more money. So when it comes to incremental budgeting, it's, it, it is subject to manipulation by the staff. Because at the end of the day, they know that, okay, in the next year, they are going to base on our preview on this performance to give us money for the next year. So we should make sure that we place this money so that they don't give us less money. So instead of them saving costs, they'll end up to uh, utilize more of the money. And at the end of the day, that is what they will base on for the next budgeting. So just try to understand the concepts. You can be able to think through and uh, create uh, something that is constructive that the examiner can actually pick a point from. Of course, giving examples is very key here, especially in this paper, like you've seen 
uh, the learning outcomes, learning outcomes and assessment examiner expects you to give practical examples of what exactly is happening. You get it. So it's very important for us to understand this question four was uh, asking us, uh, what was it asking us here? Now, question four is asking us to construct a break-even chart to show LMS's margin of safety for the second quarter of uh, 2019 at planning level. Now, the break-even chart is, uh, you'll find it in the cost volume profit analysis topic. And uh, we shall try to understand how we draw a break-even chart uh, for, uh, for an organization. So here, that's what they were asking. And they were giving you over eight marks. They were also uh, asking you things to do with margin of safety. Margin of safety is also with a uh, break even. Basically, by margin of safety, here we are trying to mean uh, we are looking at where is the organization, what 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 level the organization is at, as well as its break even point. So the 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 distance, the difference between where you are maybe your level of uh, maybe uh, production or sales to where the break even is that difference that that difference is actually your margin of safety because we are looking at by how much will you fall to 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 go past the break even so we'll try to demonstrate that when we get to that topic for you to have an insight of how the margin of safety is uh, explained but as well as how do we calculate that here they are trying to ask you assess the effect of changing the cost system uh, on the on on department profits. It's right there. Uh, three reasons why organizations don't apply the cost volume profit analysis in making decisions. Yeah, this is the CVP. It has its limitations. CVP assumes uh, uh, a constant price. Assumes assumes different. Uh, it has different assumptions. So it is from those assumptions that you can craft and be able to give reasons why organizations don't apply because the assumptions mean that uh, if those conditions don't happen, for example, if you don't, if, if prices are, are keeping on to change, then the CVP analysis will not be appropriate. So you just pick like three assumptions, craft them, and you're able to provide and uh, and at least uh, those three marks. So you can see every question has some theoretical element that you can be able to uh, support you, at least make uh, good marks. So as uh, we proceed here, this was uh, uh, this KDA management on whether to accept cow's proposal. I think cow's uh, I don't know what cow's proposal was uh, trying to to propose here, but this could be uh, a short term decision making kind of um, question. Let me see, Carl's proposal, just expect that. Marginal costs, supported, as mentioned in growing, supplying. Okay, I think we shall try to go uh, in detail when we, when, we, when we come to aspects of um, revision. So I just, I just wanted to give you an insight of how, uh, how this will look like. And I hope it's uh it has uh, been a bit helpful to you as uh, we proceed through. I see people getting on and off. I hope it's not an issue of network. I know uh, some people may just be in this class just to see what exactly happens here. It's also okay. I know you you can't uh, leave the class without uh, learning one or two things. Like I said, life is about learning. Every day you learn something. We don't, only, we don't only learn for exams, but we continuously learn to make sure that we, uh, we, we, we are adding value to ourselves and the, and the people that are around us. So that is why it is very important. So that's how the, uh, the exam may look like, uh, like you've seen, the examination structure. And then we have our detailed syllabus. Uh, we usually go through uh, this labas in detail because we want to help our students uh, make sure that they understand the journey ahead of them. You know, uh, you don't just start from topic one and you go through without understanding what is the journey ahead of me. Because at the end of the day, 
it is from the syllabus that the examiner will just pick something and say, so just like the way we, we've seen some of the questions the other side. Somebody will just pick a question and, uh, uh -huh, for example, here, limitation of CVP. You already saw a question the other side that was talking about why do organizations uh, not use the, uh, the cost volume profit analysis model? And here they are bringing you, they are giving you the limitation. So whatever you, you're studying, whatever is in this uh, syllabus is, will actually be the, the same things that will transform into the questions that the examiner will set for you. So it's very good for you to, uh, to have this syllabus on you with you for each paper that you're preparing. You understand? So I already went through some of these things. I already went through some of the roles of uh, management, the management accountant, uh, the decision-making process. How do we make uh, decisions from having different alternatives, collecting information on each of the alternative, uh, making, the, make, 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 making decision on which alternative to use, aspects of evaluation and monitoring to make sure that the decision we've actually uh, taken uh, rhymes with what exactly is happening. You get it. So this is the introduction part. It corresponds bit of management accountants. I already told you why we need to be ethical as management accountants because management makes lots of decisions based on the information that we provide. So we have to maintain the aspect of ethics. I think ethics is a very common thing in most of all the papers because this is a professional paper and uh, some of these principles we have to keep uh, bringing them to your attention to make sure that at the end of the day when you're done with uh, CPA you don't go and uh, misrepresent the profession. So it's important. Uh, aspect of information communication. Yeah, information, understanding that information is processed data, uh, the measurement theory, uh, understanding the uh, communication of information, illustrating why information is very important, uh, the decision-making model, decision-making as planning and control, all these things. This is all theory. There is no calculation even this first topic. And uh, uh, we're able to go through, provide you notes. You're able to do uh, at least self-reading that can also help you. Then you're also able to find, look out for questions that uh, have such things because here you're only studying. So when you go through and look at some of the questions, you're able to uh, relate some of this information and it is able to stick in your mind. So CVP is one of our topics here, like you've seen. Uh, we have uh, the economist model, as well as uh, we have the accountants model. So you will uh, try to understand how the two models differ. One is, uh, is, in a, is like a curve, the economist, the accountant is a straight line. Basically the CVP, here we are plotting uh, the cost. Uh, we are also plotting the uh, cost uh, revenue, then the aspect of quantity or volume. So we shall try to understand. Basically here we're trying to see how does volume uh, profit as well as cost and revenue? How do they, uh, what's the relationship between them? So we will understand all those things as well as the aspect of break even point at a point in time where the total revenue uh, matches the total, the total costs and see aspects of contribution. By contribution here, we are trying to mean uh, your price less the variable cost, as well as uh, the profit volume ratio, aspects of margin of safety, I already shared about that. Uh, break even charts, like you've seen the other side, they were asking us to draw a break even chart. So we shall I try to understand, and you see uh, our mode of study, every topic we study here, we, we try to look out for past paper questions to see how have they been, uh, how, how have such a topic been set? So like, for example, break even chart here, after this, we'll look at how the other question was set and how can we be able to use the knowledge that we've gotten from class to try to uh, uh, calculate the other question to prepare for the exam. Uh, trying to understand how CVP analysis is uh, applicable to non manufacturing decisions. Yeah, that one we shall also do. Then we have relevant costing. Uh, this is also common to people who have done cost and management accounting before. 
in here we are looking at uh, what are relevant relevant costs of course uh when somebody says relevant relevant costs means that uh, costs that uh, will affect a given decision so we shall look at relevant uh, costs as well uh things like sunk costs costs that uh, you incurred already previously uh, uh we look at uh, notional costs costs that uh uh, just to do with uh, allocation, uh, maybe across the organization, which I'll look at different things uh, and uh, what to exactly consider in determining relevant costs as well as revenue. Uh, as well as uh, when it comes to materials and labor, we shall also try to understand the relevant costs in the different situations. If it comes of material, there are cases where maybe uh, uh, you already have some materials in the warehouse, uh, and you're not going to use them for any other thing. Some materials are already in scrub value. We shall try to understand relevant costing is one of the interesting topics and say it's very common uh, that the examiner is really interested in it because uh, it's a common scenario that happens in real life. So getting down uh, aspects of application of relevant costing analysis decision making. This is where we come to special pricing decisions. The special pricing decision, like I gave you an example of Ministry of Health uh, trying to order for water not right now at a price that is lower than the market value. Uh, we shall look at product mix. Uh, by product mix here, uh, we are trying to look at, um, uh, for example, maybe you're into production of, uh, maybe you're in the baking industry and uh, maybe you have, uh, you have different limitations when it comes to uh, your materials. We shall look at aspects of limiting factor by limiting factor, maybe this could either be machine, uh, maybe machine uh, running hours. Limiting factor could also be around labor because you, your given labor cannot uh, maybe work beyond given hours. It could also be uh, around a given raw material. Maybe that raw material you only have it to in a given quantity and it cannot go beyond that given quantity. So it's a limiting factor for you. And in here, when we're doing an analysis, we're trying to see uh, how can we al best allocate the limiting factor to be able to get the best output out of, uh, out of that. So very important. Aspects of outsourcing, like I said, make or buy analysis. Some organizations have continuously understood that you cannot produce everything. If you're in a, a manufacturing, uh, maybe you're doing cars, you may opt to outsource tires from another organization. So you should try to understand under what circumstances do organizations make such decisions to say, let's make instead of buying or let's buy instead of making. So important decisions, quantitative and qualitative, because when you're making decisions around make or buy, you also have to understand that some of the people that you're buying from are not only serving you, but are also serving your competitors. So uh, are you okay with uh, such something happening? Or uh, areas also to do with um, you uh, making sure that whatever you, you, you're actually outsourcing does not make uh, maybe your trade secrets uh, maybe expose the public. Because if, if somebody, for example, is supplying to you uh, uh, certain kind of ingredients, at the end of the day, a computer may also be getting ingredients from the same, for example, maybe Rihama and Coca-Cola, if they are getting maybe certain kind of things from the same from the same supplier. It's much like that at the end of the day, we shall start testing Reham, like the way we test Coca-Cola. So those are decisions that we shall look at. Aspects of discontinuation decisions. Here you're looking at, let's say you have different branches and maybe one branch is not performing over the other. But also uh, in the analysis, we go ahead, uh, you know, some branch, a branch may be making a loss because of the way you actually calculating the profit uh, uh, on, on, on that given branch. Maybe there's an allocation of the head office cost that is actually bringing this, uh, maybe this branch to uh, maybe to a, a loss. So we shall try to understand how do we look at different segments of businesses and evaluate and see if we discontinue this segment, uh, what is our overall profit or what kind of contribution that does this segment that we want to uh, discontinue bring it to the overall organization. 
So we will look at all those. You know, it's not it's not about just saying close that branch. It's about doing the, an evaluation because that branch might be taking on some costs from uh, uh, from the head office. That once you close it, means that these costs have actually been met by the existing branches. So we also look at uh, uh, the costing systems. Uh, you know, costs is one of the key uh, aspects of uh, an organization performance. So how can we uh, manage our costs? One of the commonest topic is ABC. I know some of you must have interfaced with this, especially people who have done cost and management accounting. So we shall get down to understand ABC and see how do we uh, look at aspects of cost drivers, uh, aspects of um, uh, classification of activities. How can we make decisions uh, based on our results using ABC, ETC, as well as uh, the profitability analysis. I already talked about that. Uh, continuously organizations uh, do profitability analysis. It could be either customer or looking at different branches, ETC. So away from ABC, we also have target costing. Uh, by target costing here, we are trying to look at um, the organization has a given, uh, maybe uh, it wants to earn a given revenue or maybe it wants to sell uh, a commodity at a given price. So if may, for example, if the price of let's say water is 1,000, uh, the organization may, uh, may let's say, uh, may want to make maybe a margin of 20%, maybe 20% on, on 1,000 is 200. So it has to uh, target a cost of making this, let's say water at let's say 800. So we shall try to understand what is, it, how, what is it target costing exactly? And what is the process that we go through? Just like the way, determining what is the price, uh, looking at what margin we want, and then we get, the, it, we get a cost. So that would be like our target. We shouldn't uh, maybe spend uh, either above that cost. So look at that. I will look at aspects of reverse engineering, uh, value chain analysis. Uh, yes, and then life cycle costing, you know, life cycle, uh, uh, every product goes through a life cycle. So we'll try to understand from introduction, growth to maturity to decline, how do we uh, cost those different levels of the life cycle of a product. But then also trying to see how can uh, 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 an organization uh, make sure that uh, if it's incorporating the cost of its products in, into uh, maybe the price, over, overall, uh, across the life cycle, times like the decline where maybe the business is, uh, has low revenue and, and the times were of maybe introduction why when there is kind of uh, high revenue, how can the organization create an average cost across the product life cycle to make sure that it's uh, not overpricing its product? I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, when it comes to uh, uh, costing, it mostly uh, the general assumption is that you get your, what you've incurred and add a margin and sell. But you realize that if a product is being introduced in the market, there are lots of costs that we incur, like research and development. So you cannot incorporate all the costs that you've incurred in your research and development in, into your initial products. So what organizations will do is they will spread, they will foresee through the life cycle of this product and try to, uh, allocate some of those costs that they have incurred earlier on. I'll give you an example. Uh, if uh, maybe you're entering it into uh, a product like maybe, okay, time like this, uh, uh, drink, some drinks are, are making money because they have uh, some kind of uh, ingredients of what people are recommending for maybe uh, the COVID situation. So if you want to, to edit such a product, you go through certain different costs of maybe making a logo, uh, maybe trying to, uh, to, 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 to test uh, your, your product, going through your RSP and it is. So there are several costs. So you cannot incorporate all those costs into your product. At the end of the day, you have different things that you have to look at. So we'll go on to all those details 
and see how life cycle costing does. It's also one of uh, interesting topics. Uh, pricing decisions, yes. By pricing decisions here, we are trying to look at why do you think uh, MTN's mobile money has those rates? Why is uh, maybe the Coca-Cola bottle priced at 1,000? Why is, let's say, start time priced at the price it is? Why is GoTV pricing at a given? So we have different uh, pricing techniques, but then also we have uh, different uh, kind of uh, pricing policies that organizations usually use. So things like cost plus pricing, we know very well the cost plus pricing, like I said, uh, this is very common. You find this, especially with the retailers, that I buy something and then add a value, I add a margin on it, and I sell. Like people who sell phones, you get it. So we shall look at that. We shall look at target uh, markup percentages. This is very similar to uh, uh, to aspects uh, like the target costing we just looked at. Yeah, cases where uh, organizations price their products with a target on a given uh, kind of markup. Yes, we shall get down uh, pricing policies, price scheming, where it's like price premium, it's premium pricing, where you introduce a product at a higher price. We shall look at uh, aspects of uh, penetration pricing, where products are introduced at a lower price and so on. Then we have the customer profitability analysis. I already talked of this, that where you evaluate how much you're making on each customer, and then you you attract uh, a given set of customers because uh, they are profitable than the other. The other is the transfer pricing, very common topic here. Uh, transfer pricing uh, is very common when it comes to divisions, uh, maybe uh, where the head office is selling certain products to a given division. There's a transfer price, so like an internal price uh, pricing mechanism. Shall try to understand the different methods and uh, trying to understand also how we can uh, resolve some of the conflicts that might happen there. Because these are the same organizations, so there is interselling. So there are times where there is conflict, the conflict might come up. I'll give you an example, like uh, Spear Motors uh, has a section for selling vehicles and has also has a section for repair and maintenance. So you may find that uh, this, uh, the, the side of selling vehicles sells a vehicles with a guarantee that uh, you access repair and maintenance during the whole period. Now, because these departments want to work independently, uh, they want to make sure that uh, we set, let's say, targets for them, uh, maybe uh, uh, in terms of revenue uh, and so on. So we want to say that uh, repairs and maintenance sells its services to the car selling uh, division. So in there, we have to make sure that uh, no one is, let's say, overpricing the other. At the end of the day, the overall objective is what we call goal congruency. At the end of the day, the overall goal uh, of the organization has to take lead or has to take precedence at the end of the day. So look at domestic and international transfer pricing. International transfer pricing has, are very common with multinational companies. Like the way you see MTN, MTN uh, Uganda and MTN South Africa, it might have some products. Maybe it buys phones in bulk, uh, maybe from Dubai and distributes onto the different subsidiaries. So we shall try to understand if MTN South Africa is uh, maybe uh, selling phones to MTN Uganda, because at the end of the day, MTN South Africa itself is an entity on its own. It has to make its revenue, it has also to meet its costs. So we shall try to understand. How can uh, we be able to incorporate that price? You know, what happens, especially with international transfer pricing, this is an interest that URA is very interested in because uh, companies use it to uh, avoid taxes. So it's very key that an organization has a transfer pricing. So that is very key, clear on how the mother company charges this local company, either for staff, either for products, etc. So very critical for us. The other aspect is uh, risk and uncertainty. It's also a very common topic that you'll find uh, very interesting. And uh, I think for, uh, for, for, for a time like this, when we are during the time of, uh, of the lockdown, and also knowing that uh, the situation is not 
uh, okay for businesses, a topic like this would, would really come to the mind of the examiner to make sure that uh, they set something around uncertainty because uh, uh, we want to make sure that the exams also don't, uh, they, they, are, they are reflecting the actual situation that is really happening. So we shall try to understand aspects of decision trees. How do we make decisions using decision trees, probability theory, uh, situations of max, mean, uh, max, max, mean, max, criteria, etc. And then the management control uh, systems, you know, this paper is MDC, is management control, management decision and control. So we shall get down into uh, management control system. This is whole theory. Uh, trying to understand what kind of controls organizations put up. Uh, controls could be around uh, employees, social, cultural, could be around, uh, uh, they could be revenue-based controls, like maybe profit margins and whatever it is. So you shall try to understand, as well as uh, uh, what kind of effects, uh, harmful effects of controls, you know, when you put controls, uh, sometimes there are aspects of demotivation of staff, Staff may be a bit demotivated uh, uh, because uh, they just want to work freely, things to do with setting uh, targets, preparation of budgeting and target process process. This is a, a theoretical topic and most of the questions that really come out of this are really theory based. Uh, we also have uh, uh, the key topic, budgeting and budgetary. You like you saw up when we were trying to look at uh, the learning objective. Budgeting is one of the core core topics of this paper because it's uh, it's one of the core roles of any management accountant in the organization. So we'll get down into down to understand uh, what budgeting does, the different budgeting techniques. I already gave you examples of things like zero based budgeting, incremental budgeting. Uh, we also have the activity based budgeting, which is very similar to ABC. Uh, we also have flexible budgeting. Uh, where we, uh, we, we, we try to flex our budgets to make sure that uh, they represent the actual results. Yes. Similar to that is the standard costing and variance analysis. This is one of uh, those tools. I think you saw the other question that was asking, I think, limitations of this uh, technique. So we shall get down into how to uh, set uh, standards, how to do variance analysis, uh, things like mix and yield variances, ETC. And then the division performance evaluation. Uh, like you've seen, uh, we have segments, you know, business segments. Uh, organizations are taking on that aspect of uh, working in divisions, working in branches. So shall I try to understand? I already say that uh, when it comes to the division performance evaluation, we are trying to look at the division performance, but as well as the managerial performance, because there are managers that are in charge of this division. So we evaluate and see how much uh, 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 is every maybe branch bringing in? What is the profit? We shall get down into things like traceable profits, uh, like um, uh, uh, controllable profit, etc. So as well as uh, different different uh, performance evaluation systems and uh, uh, different categories that's like residual income, outcash rate, residual income, outcash rate, return on investment. Yeah, it is. So not very complicated things. These are things that uh, you interface at your workplace. You just need somebody to clarify them to you, somebody to give you uh, the election yeah, and give you experience. You know, uh, in some, most of our classes, you'll find that uh, we, 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 are not, we are not like professors who have never been in the field. Uh, myself, um, I've been in, I've, I'm, 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 I'm already into the profession and several years of experience. So you'll find that most of the things that I really share are things that have examples to them. And that's why you see, even as we've gone through this rough kind of first quest, uh, uh, session, I, I want to relate everything to uh, how, what exactly is happening in the real world. Yeah. So like you see, types of incentives, incentives to staff, things to do with bonuses, share options. Yeah, ETC. Then cost estimation and regression. 
this is another topic that comes from paper two. But here, of course, these are uh, here we get down into other aspects. We try to advance it a little, a little further. As you can see, cost estimation methods like engineering method, inspection of accounts, graphical, what, whatever it is, I don't know. Yes, so we get down to do, uh, things to do with uh, uh, learning curve theory. Yeah, here, learning curve theory is very key. Here, we are looking at uh, labor. Yeah, you know, uh, we understand that uh, when you join an organization, you're not as somebody who has been there for a long period of time. So there's a learning curve effect on two labor. So we shall try to understand how do we apply that in areas of costing, uh, planning, whatever it is. Then inventory is one of uh, uh, my favorite topics as well. Inventory, you might have interfaced this, those that did cost and management accounting, or you did uh, maybe a degree in accounting, you might have interfaced about the EO2 model, economic order quantity model. So we shall try to understand uh, how to apply the EO2 model, aspects of safety stock, get down into other inventory techniques, like you saw just in time technique, as you can see. We saw a question on the other side that was asking about just in time. So Many things that uh, are here that are very common that you will interface linear programming is right here. You see? Not any different from what you started, just trying to advance a little. Then the cost management and strategic management accounting. Here we are getting into uh, some of the new systems, uh, aspects of the ABM, activity-based management. You know, we already talked about activity-based costing. So this is another, uh, an advancement of the ABC. We shall look at how the, the two relate. Uh, things to do with benchmarking. Of course, benchmarking uh, here, we're trying to look at uh, an organization, benchmarking on another organization. So we shall look at area, how the benchmarking process goes. Uh, what are the importances? This is all theoretical, by the way. So some of the theoretical questions may really come from here. Business re-engineering, as you can see. Management audits, value chain analysis. Very, very, very uh, uh, friendly things. The just-in-time philosophy is here. The total quality management. Total quality, yeah, we're trying to mean where everyone is, uh, everyone is contributing to make sure that uh, there is uh, quality in the way production from uh, from production, from sourcing of raw materials. Every activity is towards uh, making sure that we have quality. So that's how Tichum M is. Then things like balance core card, uh, environmental cost management, ETC. So honestly, I've really run through this very fast just to give you an insight of how the journey really looks like. Uh, this is a cost outline that you really have, I believe. If you guess you really don't have, I can share that with you. But you should be able to develop your confidence right now uh, onto this paper if you're making a decision to actually join it. Because at the end of the day, uh, these concepts, when you start on them very early, a time like this when you have a lot of time, uh, I'll make sure that when you join my class, I'll actually give you notes in advance so that you use this time to read. You can even read ahead before the class so that when we come to the class, you're able to ask uh, questions uh, onto what you didn't understand. So a time like this is a good time for you to jump onto management decision and control. And uh, yeah, you get rolling. So I want to uh, welcome uh, any questions, if there are any. I know I see the class has dropped now somehow, maybe people are busy. But uh, if you have any question now, this paper, like you saw on our timetable, it will be running uh, uh, on Saturday and uh, uh, this weekday. Now, this is uh, maybe during this time of the lockdown. Yes, we can have it during the, uh, the week like this on a Thursday evening but maybe we can have adjustments as we proceed. If you join this paper uh, as, uh, as, as a student, you, you'll be able to access the revision as well. You don't have to uh, join the revision and join uh, the normal paper. 
So you can access the revision class if you're part of the, uh, the normal class. So the revision class, I only made it for people who have done this paper before. And for them, all they want is question, answer, question, answer. So that is how, uh, that is how the revision class would be structured. But for the normal class, we get a topic, we get down into details, we give you the notes, we, uh, we later go to look at uh, some of the questions that are similar to, uh, to that given topic. So that is how it runs. So do we have any question? Do we have any comments? I would love to hear from you uh, in the comment section on what are your thoughts about the class. And uh, you can use the chat box or you can actually unmute and say something. So I'm waiting, comments, please uh, type for me in the chat box. What thoughts about your class, any comments? Uh, Avaga Michael says uh, for, for the vision class, you can also share notes. Okay, uh, that, is, uh, that, is, that, is, that, is, that is noted. It's okay, I'll, I'll, if you join the revision class, I'll share the notes. I, I, I may promise on that as well. Okay, any other? Any other, any other comment, any other question? I think you've so far given us a good introduction. Just clarify on the lecture days. Yes, uh, we have, uh, you, you know, uh, like I told you, shall we be able to do a mock exam? Yes, we shall have a mock exam. Uh, I'm just trying to, uh, uh, at, the first, at the start of the lecture, I asked if it's your first time or it's your second time, and most people told me it was the first time, I think apart from, from Florence. So, uh, basically, we will have a revision class on one of the days. So I don't know uh, is if you feel is today uh, okay for you. Do you does anyone of you have a challenge of attending uh, the the actual class on Saturday? I realized I, I included uh, this uh, this uh, Saturday from two to five. So is anyone having a challenge with joining the class, uh, the normal class uh, from two to five? I don't know what the, what the yes says. But what I'll do, uh, I know most people are, uh, could be busy. I cannot just, uh, I don't know if I have another class uh, uh, on Saturday. Let me just try to see. Cost and management. I can take the class to an evening as well. So that, uh, uh, people i know lunch time from 2 to 5 getting some people it's a bit it's a bit hard so i may tune the class uh, depending i'll actually do a class on saturday same time and hear from people uh, but i will i i will change i may change the this class to evening yeah, just to give a chance to uh, people because i know uh, most of you maybe during the day you have many distractions Maybe during the evenings, uh, maybe during the evenings, it's very hard for you. Someone says, Avaga Michael, I paid some money, but I haven't gotten a receipt. Okay, Avaga, I, uh, you try to reach me, uh, uh, reach out to me uh, via WhatsApp. I have not been active on WhatsApp for, uh, for a day or two, but I'm going there up, up after here. So drop me a WhatsApp. Uh, with uh, 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 with the details, then we can start from there. Someone says, good stuff. I'm truly interested. And thank you for laboring to get the nitty gritty of this paper. You read it good. I'm impressed. Thank you so much. And we'll inbox you in case I need ad assistance. So, so thank you, Nicholas, for, for the comments. So I want to hear from other people. I have uh, over 16 people here, and I've only heard from two or three people. I, which class are you joining? Are you joining the revision class or you're joining the normal class? Could you just type in the chat box just for me to know? It helps me on to making some of the decisions that I want to make right now.
indicate either you're joining the revision class or you're joining the normal class. Okay. Could you could you please create a group for communication purposes? Every student who joins the class will have special uh, uh, WhatsApp groups for specific papers. And that's where we, 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 we do. Uh, someone says I will be joining the, uh, 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 both the classes, normal class, normal class. Okay, yeah. So it's okay. It's, 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 it's very fine. So I see uh, mostly normal class here. So for normal class, uh, are we okay with uh, uh, with uh, with with uh, Saturday uh, same time seven to nine? I hope so. Are we okay with those two hours? Because uh, today Tuesday, uh, I want to do it specifically for the revision class. But like I said, if you're part of the normal class, eh, uh, you can also join the revision class. So you don't have to pay for the revision class. That is how good it is. So you can join the Saturday class as a normal class and also join this class when you have, if you have time. Yeah, so that is how good it is. So I hope I've, I've clarified that and I look forward to seeing all of you join the class. In case you have any question, any clarifications, please reach out to me. You can, uh, uh, you ca you can uh, send me a WhatsApp and let's get talking. I know most of you uh, have followed me. I also do a lot of write-ups on uh, CPA. So you can uh, find me on Facebook in those WhatsApp groups. Yeah, there's a lot that uh, we, can, uh, we can try to share in, in the profession. I know uh, the situation is not easy. Some of you may not even be able to afford this class. And that's why we are saying you, pay you can pay 50% and join. Now, in case uh, you cannot join, you can join us later on when you get the money. I will endeavor to uh, do maybe some few recordings of, of the classes. So in case you get a challenge with joining one of the classes, uh, you can uh, maybe... Uh, you can access some recordings as well to help you. I know some of you might have issues of network because you're on and off and you're wondering, can I still learn? Yes, you can still learn. Uh, we'll, try, we'll try our best to try to see, uh, uh, to try to see how we can support you at the end of the day. Yeah, so I hope, I hope that is okay. I'll, I for one will be doing revision. Uh, my number, please. Uh, my WhatsApp number is is that. I think you've seen, you might have uh, even contacted me somehow. Zero seven zero three eight zero thirty two fifty five. Yeah, so that is my number. So thank you for the comments. Uh, uh, in case you have any question, please drop it in the chat box. Otherwise, it's been nice having you for this class. And I look forward to more classes with you. Yeah, let's, despite the circumstances, let's try to do something that can keep us busy. Let's progress on our CPA journey. I want to tell you that uh, the CPA journey uh, is, uh, how can, now, uh, Sam, if you are paying, if you, pay for the normal class, the 250,000, you don't need to pay for the revision class, like I've told you. So you only pay uh, for the normal class. Yeah. So I was saying that uh, your CPA journey matters a lot uh, to, to your career. I want to tell you that myself, I, I really benefited from this by finishing my CPA. It really helped me grow in my career. So make sure that you prioritize, you sacrifice that smoker money because uh, uh, our papers are, are, are being, they are charging you, let's say 250,000. Maybe overall, uh, overall you're spending, let's say maybe two or three million, uh, maybe on your course or four million, whatever it is. But at the end of the day, when you finish this course and your professional accountant, Somebody's going to give you a job. I remember uh, 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 when I finished my CPA, 
uh, I went for one of the interviews and uh, somebody was asking, how much can we pay you? And I was like, I actually didn't want to work for those people. So I told, I told them I want to uh, ask them for 8 million shillings. Yes, 8 million shillings. And surprisingly, these guys went on to negotiate more and said, uh, can we uh, give you maybe seven? Can we? Now, at the end of the day, when I went for the second interview, because they were trying to accept the 8 million, I later told them that I've changed my mind. I want 9 million. At the end of the day, they even willing to give me. So why am I saying this? That there's a lot of value that CPA brings to you. When people see you with that CPA outside there, it can bring, you might be earning a low salary right now, but you can be able to add this paper every, at least every, every paper you finish adds more credibility to you. That job will come and will give you a good salary that you're looking out for. So I'll tell you myself, uh, uh, it's about now, about, uh, about two, about three, about, about three years. Yes, about maybe three years since I finished my CPA. I was able to grow from accountant. I became a finance manager. Now I'm, I'm working with, uh, uh, with one of the international NGOs as a, partner, as a finance partnership lead. So I'm already at a leadership position in my finance career just because of CPA. I've not even finished my master's already. So, so that was just a point of counsel. And uh, somebody said, would you able to share with us a study kit? I really don't have a, uh, a study kit for ISPAL that you get it from there. What we provide and only uh, are notes uh, for our students. For the revision, revision, uh, you, you, you know, re re revision, basically, we use the past paper questions, which you can access this. So everything is being done online because we cannot access you right now so that, that is what happens so the notes i'll share on email and other materials we shall continue to share with you as well that can help you so thank you so much and uh i wish you the best in the in this night and wish you the best in your cp journey i look forward to seeing most of you as you join me for this class. So I want to close, call this class to one end uh, until when we meet again, uh, maybe, yeah. But uh, uh, Saturday, uh, uh, Saturday you may not have to join in uh, because uh, I, there are some students who would be interested, who would think that that is the, uh, the actually the normal class. So you may not join, but when you you contact me immediately when you make the payment, and I'll add you to the WhatsApp group, and we'll be able to. Huh, can that person ask to join the normal class? No. No, 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 no. If somebody joins, uh, 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 the normal class is basically for people who are fresh. Yeah, and we have controls. Um, I'm sorry. The controls uh, uh, don't allow me to do to do to do to do to do that. Yeah. So, thank you so much, and uh, uh, see you then. Bye bye.